everybody to our first talk after spring break. We had a nice spring break. It's good. Getting readjusted. <laughs> um, so as usual, I have a sign-in sheet. If you are here um, as part of your class, that would be great. Um, and so I wanted to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, we are very fortunate in the Bay Area to have so many amazing experts, expert researchers on so many different topics about the environment, the natural world, impacts that humans are causing. So today uh, we have Dr. David Ainley, who is a, um, an expert on um, basically all things Antarctica. Um, he has been at Antarctica over 35 times on research um, vessels and doing uh, research on um, marine mammals, um, seabirds, penguins. And today we're actually going to hear about penguins. Um, and uh, his, also his, um, you know, he, he's a researcher, he's done, he's published so many papers, um, uh, you know, describing the species and the natural history, but also the impacts of humans, especially in the Ross Sea. And so um, he, because of his work, um, he was, uh, he played a large role in a movie that's out, I think you can still see it, in the theaters, or maybe you can it now, um, called The Last Ocean. It's about the Ross Sea, and if you haven't seen it, you really need to rent it and take a look at it. Um, this is, you know, um, in Antarctica, and you just think, well, you know, that is so far away, but we know as environmental studies students so that humans are impacting um, the you know, climate and also um, ecosystems everywhere on Earth, including in Antarctica. So today we're going to hear. Um, um, Dr. Ainley, tell us about his research on the Adelie penguin and um, and the interesting, I've heard this talk before, it's an amazing talk, um, and the effects of climate change on these birds. So, welcome. sea ice, 
they, um, and also by land ice. So sea ice is frozen ocean land ice and glaciers. Um, okay, so the daily penguin being a sea ice obligate, you can describe its occurrence by where sea ice occurs around Antarctica. It doesn't occur out here uh, where there is no sea ice. Um, but also glacial ice is important as well. Um, most of Antarctica is covered by glacial ice. There's very few areas where there is land that's exposed and also reducing this even far, even more, very little land that a penguin could access. Um, and so in this case, this glacier has retreated and um, left this bare area for these are all penguin colonies here, the guano. And the penguin, these particular penguin makes the nest of little rocks which are left by glaciers, um, glacial moraines. Um, so glaciers need to retreat to provide a nesting area and um, also they provide a piece of rock for the penguins. Um, okay, so uh, we've all heard about how global warming is causing Things disappear, right? Now, who is it? Have you all heard that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. So um, this bit of the story, really, it, there is a basis for it in the um, scientific literature. There is a probably the, one of the best or study. Well, it's an LTER study that's um, being conducted. The Palmer Station on the Antarctic Peninsula. I'm sure you're familiar with it, what the LTERs are, long-term ecological research. It's an actual part of NSF. And they only fund, um, I don't know, there's about 20 LTER studies in North America. And for some reason, they, they, have, they do fund two marine studies, one of which is in the Antarctic Peninsula, and um, the other is at Santa Barbara. But um, anyway, this is a very complete look at the ocean and um, they cut the whole ecosystem in which, um, in this case, these penguins exist. So it, it's like a uh, Cadillac of, um, or I should say the Tesla of, uh, you know, marine, marine research. Um, okay, so the story from from the Palmer Station LTER is that the daily penguins have been decreasing elsewhere um, in parts of the Antarctic Peninsula. Then there's also the story of chinstrap penguins, a relative of daily penguins that's also decreasing. Um, and so you've heard of all this, the media's picked up on penguins disappearing and so it's been featured prominently in magazines, on television, and all kinds of places. Um, so, um, however, most of these reports of disappearing penguins come from the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, which is close to South America. And so it's a place where news reporters visit. And so that's kind of the story that gets passed to the public. And what you hear on television, that kind of stuff. Um, and so indeed, the uh, penguins in the northern Antarctic Peninsula, the daily penguins have been decreasing it's from 1975 up to the present. The daily penguins have pretty much almost disappeared, beginning back here at 16,000 pairs, now down to less than 2,000 pairs. Um, at the same time, chinstrap penguins for a while increased, but now they're decreasing. And this third species of penguin um, is um, a, a, not a, it's, anyway, it's, it's increasing. Um, it's not very abundant. Um, there's maybe only like 500 pairs. This is all, this is the relative change in population. This is the, the actual numbers of penguins. So anyway, you can see where the trends are. So these two species, the most two most abundant ones, are back disappearing. 
in the Antarctic Peninsula area. Okay, so, but then the question is, um, you know, how general is this um, trend? And that's a simple question, but as I promised, it maybe isn't easy. Isn't easy. So, are you ready? Okay, so there is this uh, concept of um, in, in, in ecology of in the, habit, in the habitats of animals, how there is, um, you know, it's, it can be an optimum sort of characteristics of a habitat, and then on either side, it becomes less optimum. And in this case, an amount of uh, ice, for pedialic penguins, you can have too much ice, and penguins react negatively to it. Or you can have too little ice, and they can react to that as well, but particularly with respect to sea ice. Um, okay, but these, so these different species of penguins, and these are the three that I just mentioned, have different, um, let's say, you know, preferences for, for the prevalence of sea ice and other aspects of the ecosystem there. Um, and there are, they are quite different. The, as I said, the Adelie and the Chinstrap are um, more comfortable with sea ice. The Gentoo penguin um, very, has very little, uh, prefers not to have much ice around. And so um, you get this sort of relationships where the Adelie, this is, um, you know, the sort of a continuum of decreasing up to increasing uh, population change with spot line no change. And so because of changing, essentially changing habitat, changing ecosystem, the daily penguins are decreasing rapidly in the Antarctic Peninsula area. Ginstrap penguins only recently have started to decrease and um, but Gen 2 payments um, have been showing this uh, in actually the, the opposite sort of response. Okay, so here I was talking about the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. And so what about the other side of Antarctica, a um, place called the Ross Sea? Well, in the Ross Sea, at least with the daily penguins, um, the um, Population trajectories are quite the opposite. Um, the daily penguins have been generally been increasing in the Ross Sea area. And of course, as I said, you don't hear this in the news because the news doesn't like happy stories. <laughs> um, okay, and then that previous draft takes you up to like 2005, and then uh, more recently, you know, up to the present. You can see that um, these daily penguins are increasing pretty um, dramatically. Um, don't worry about Cape Royce, which is a little tiny place. Um, so in this area of Ross, of Southern Ross Sea, there is about 10% of the world population of the daily penguins. So this is a major, this increase is a major thing going on with the daily penguins. Okay, and around the, oh, the Ross Sea is over here, and then so this is East Antarctica and Australia is up here. And a similar but not quite as dramatic trend has been happening in this part of Antarctica as well, um, increasing in daily penguins. Uh, okay, so we have these two very contrasting um, trends. And um, if you're a physicist, ocean, marine physicist, it's really simple. Um, okay, well, a lot of this change has to do with changing sea ice extent. Um, here we have a continuum of ice. Um, way down in the blue is reduced sea ice extent. That's the amount of ice that extends out from, Antar from the Antarctic coast up to um, the other way, where you have um, Oh, also increased in extent and decreased extent. So you can see that in the Antarctic Peninsula, sea ice has been disappearing. And so the story you get from the news media is correct. Um, however, in this part of Antarctica, the Ross Sea, 
sea ice has been expanding. Um, have have any of you ever heard of that? That's a story. No. Um, okay, so, um, well, Fox News, well, anyway. But anyway, <laughs> um, sea ice is expanding, and I guess you just don't watch Fox News because it's been waved around as evidence of global climate change isn't happening. Uh, but uh, anyway, it is happening, but it's com sort of the complex um, things going on. At the same time, not only is uh, sea ice extent um, decreasing in the Antarctic Peninsula area, but also the sea ice season, so how long in a year sea ice is present. And over the past few decades, sea ice, the sea ice season has reduced by a couple of months in the, the Antarctic Peninsula region. So not only does sea ice not extend as far off the coast as it used to, but it doesn't, it's not there for very long. It's quite the opposite in the Ross Sea area where the sea ice season is, is actually getting longer. Okay, and um, so why is this going on? Um, okay, well, that's, um, I don't know if you've heard of things, well, you know, you've all heard of El Nino. So it's called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's a climate index. And in this, and that's in, it involves the tropics. Of course, everybody's heard about El Nino. But you haven't heard of the Southern Annular Mode, I'm guessing, um, or the Antarctic Dipole. But it's a similar sort of index to uh, essentially pressure, atmospheric pressure changes over a large area. And in this case, it has to do with the, the difference in the atmospheric pressure between a Lucian, the, the Amundsen Sea low pressure system and a high pressure system in this area. And um, let's see, let's see on this thing. Oh, so SAM is similar to El Nino. El Nino oscillates, you know, from a warm phase to a cold phase to warm, cold, warm, cold, or the uh, Pacific decadal oscillation. Uh, that, but um, that's another of these oscillatory climate um, systems, that sort of a decadal periodicity. So the SAM used to oscillate from positive to negative, but since the mid 70s, it's been in its positive mode, and so that um, has done wondrous things to the ecology of the Southern Ocean, particularly through um, the strength of winds circulating around the Antarctic continent and the effect of those winds on sea ice. Um, and um, there's something I'm sure you haven't heard about either. This is all to do with the Antarctic ozone hole. It has nothing to do with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so when you talk about, when you talk about global warming here, you not be, you'd be missing the boat. But if you talk about global climate change, then this is an aspect of global climate change. It has to do with the ozone hole. And the ozone hole really is mostly over Antarctica because Antarctica is, and the South Pole is actually 10,000 feet high. And the troposphere in the poles are, is much squashed. So you've got this big ice cube sticking up through the troposphere now, a pretty hefty proportion of the troposphere, and it's actually affecting the stratus, and so this ozone is killing the ozone, the CFCs are killing the ozone in the stratosphere. Um, and so, and the stratosphere has decreased by more than nine degrees centigrade in the last 30 years over the Antarctic continent. And that's a huge change, nine degrees C. So that is what has, um, affected the pressure systems around the Antarctic to get a certain this increasing certain polar wind, uh, and it's because of this ozone hole, which isn't going away, it, despite what Obama says or President Xi, whatever it is, of China who signed the second accord to limit CFCs. Um, I mean, there was a I think called the Montreal Protocol it was signed in 1989 by 100 countries to limit CFCs, but it didn't do anything. Um, so recently, Obama and the Chinese, Chinese president signed another agreement 
Um, but it's not going to do anything either. So we still have this Antarctic ozone hole. People are still using these CFCs. Um, and this is what is causing the change in the weather, or a major factor in the changing weather around Antarctica. Um, and so this is just a representation of um, the degree to which, um, and there are other things going on, but in any case, the winds around the continent are accelerating, um, particularly, you know, a bit off the continent. So anyway, get stronger and stronger winds. Um, and here's another rendition. Um, what, what, so you've got the winds that are going around this way. So what's happening is all this wind is trying to get through this gap between the Antarctic Peninsula and the Andes Mountains. And so these are very mount, high mountains. So you've got all this wind trying to get through the Drake Passage. And it just can't all fit at the same time. So what's happening is it's being pushed up northward before it finally spills over the Andes. And, and what it's done is actually cause this big bow in the, in the uh, South Polar Jet Street. Um, and, and because of this bow, what's happening is that now they've got all this, this, this relatively warm South Atlantic that's now connected to the Antarctic Peninsula. So because of this bow in the jet stream, the, the Antarctic Peninsula being blasted by is relatively warm air. And that's why the sea ice is disappearing there. Um, it, because of the accelerating winds um, and off continent winds in the Ross Sea sector that is behind the expansion of sea ice in that area. If, if you just cooled the ocean to like minus 1.7, which is the freezing point of seawater, um, okay, you'll get, you know, some, it'll freeze um, in the area where it's minus 1.7. But if you have, and if you add wind to the system, particularly an offshore wind, and, and so this ice is formed where it's cold along the continent. So it, without the wind, it would just sit there. Um, but with wind, it, it, it pushes the ice continuously off the coast, and the ice cools the ocean farther out, farther and farther and farther. And so because of this increasing wind, you're getting an expansion of sea ice in this part of Antarctica. Um, and so this is just a review. Again, we have expanding sea ice here decreasing sea ice in the Antarctic Peninsula. Sea ice season, getting shorter here, getting longer here. Um, okay, so that's kind of what's happening at present, but there is also this is a longer term kind of aspect to this. And we know this because, and we, because of, you said the penguins, um, my very first slide is about the daily penguin being the double weather of climate change. Well, one of the reasons it's the dull weather is that it, um, in Antarctica, at least in the continental part of Antarctica, it's actually very dry. And when a penguin dies, it just doesn't go anywhere. And so there are mummies that are thousands, many thousands, even 45,000 years of age. So we, by finding these mummies and having them dated, we can know where penguins were at certain times in the past. Um, and in fact, um, here's the Antarctic Peninsula again. Um, these bones in some colonies have been dated. And what you see is that out at the tip of the Antarctic Pen Peninsula, these colonies are very young. They're only as old as the advent of the Little Ice Age. Um, so these young colonies are the ones that are disappearing as presumably, you know, during the Little Ice Age, um, sea ice expanded northward, and uh, because the daily penguins are these sea ice obligates, they, they've expanded with the sea ice. And nowadays, the ice is disappearing and getting back to these really older colonies, which are um, which were formed when, sea, when ice sheets retreat, began to retreat during the last glacial maximum. So that's why these colonies are uh, much older and founded um, as a function of the retreat of ice sheets. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. 
So as I said, if you this all that we know a lot about physics and ocean physics and all that kind of stuff, then it's um, consistent with the laws of physics. Um, okay, so what about the biology? All right, um, people say, you know, I can get a rocket scientist to like, figure this out. Well, rocket scientists never touch biology. <laughs> um, and so you've heard that, I'm sure, decreasing sea ice uh, has led to disappearing krill. Um, and so for a long time, that was kind of like the paradigm that explains everything about what penguins are doing in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Um, however, there have been other things going on in the Antarctic Peninsula besides uh, climate change. Um, back in the 60s, or 50s, 60s, there were over a million whales removed from the Southern Ocean, particularly in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Um, these whales are large and have big, big appetites. Um, and so this, um, for a long time, this has been sort of ignored by people. Climate, you know, research funding these days comes from climate change. Um, people don't really want to think about a whole lot of stuff other than climate change. Um, but, so, um, you can see that these whales, this is the, um, the take of whales in thousands. Um, you know, humpback whales, this, so this is the number of whales taken um, in the, during whaling era. And so you can see that by the uh, 60s, there are like no, almost no whales left in the, uh, in the Southern Ocean. Um, they started with the larger whales, and then they, when they got depleted, the whalers went to smaller whales. Um, finally, to the minke whale, which is um, the smallest baleen whale. Um, okay, so then the whaling ended um, around about here. I mean, ended not just because there weren't any more whales, but there was an agreement, you know, International Whaling Convention, to stop um, whaling. Um, as a result, these whales have been recovering, particularly the humpback whale, um, which also been recovering off California, you probably noticed. Um, and so now they're um, becoming pretty prevalent in the Antarctic. This is the numbers in the Antarctic Peninsula area. Um, so, and at the same time, well, also humans wiped out um, millions of fur seals. And they too, but then first, then there weren't any, and they, there's commercially no longer uh, feasible. Um, they stopped sealing, and, but, and so the, seal, the fur seals have been recovering, and so now there's like millions of uh, fur seals back. So they got so now there's climate change going on, but whales are recovering and fur seals have recovered, and um, so we have to think. We have to think outside the you know, climate change envelope and think about some other um, think about what else is going on in the ecosystem. Um, there was this idea that with the loss of all these baleen whales, there was a, a krill surplus. And, and the thought was that this, this uh, allowed certain comp competing species to um, become more abundant, or competitive species. Um, and, but um, this group of authors went through all the, the existing data, and they found that the chinstrap penguin is really the only species that uh, responded to the loss of uh, baleen whales. Um, and then more recently, um, a couple of papers, um, it was mostly, um, these papers mostly about climate change, but they unfortunately got me as a reviewer. <laughs> and um, so I hadn't forced them to uh, think about whales. And so um, these papers now talk about not just climate change, but also the fact that there's competition for particularly chinstrap penguins. And that the, one of the main reasons that chinstrap penguins are disappearing is because whales are recovering. Um, it, so then the daily penguins are decreasing because of the sea ice sort of thing. Okay, so anyway, 
we have to go back over here to the Ross Sea, where our penguins are increasing. Okay, so temperatures are increasing a little bit in the Ross Sea, but really it's like from minus 29C to minus 26C, so like, you know, if you don't go up, if you go outside without your coat, you're gonna freeze, regardless. Of um, it's getting a little bit warmer. Um, okay, but as I was developing this, this story, it really is all about the wind. Um, and again, we have this uh, kind of figure with the decreasing extent and season of sea ice in the Antarctic Peninsula and the expanding sea ice and season in this part of Antarctica. But Along the coast, you can notice these uh, areas where sea ice is disappearing. And these are what are called polinias. Um, called late, they're latent heat polinias. They, they're pretty much generated by wind. And um, this is very important to a, pen, a daily penguin. Um, so again, here's the sea ice season. But you can see that the sea ice season is getting uh, shorter in these areas where these planinias occur. So anyway, the ocean is opening up next to the coast because of this increasing wind, also causing the, the sea ice to expand farther away. Okay, so you got that. It's, sea ice is expanding on a large scale, but on a small scale, it's getting less along at the coast. Um, okay, so this is what planinias look like from the space shuttle. Um, the Ross Sea has several of these polinias that are wind driven, because the wind pushing the sea ice away from the coast. And so here's these are our peng these are actually emperor penguins and the daily penguins, which are their colonies are associated with these polinias. So anyway, real penguins. <laughs> Love planes. So, this is the scene without a planinia. Um, penguins can travel, I don't know, seven or eight kilometers per hour swimming, walking. It's about one kilometer per hour. Um, just a huge energy drain to have to walk. So penguins don't like to, these daily penguins, and even emperor penguins don't like to walk. And so that's why. These, this growing, these growing planias are um, making penguins happy. So here's the contrast of walking and swimming. Okay, so there's a slide again of penguin colonies um, in the Southern Ross Sea increasing. And this is when the, the SAM, the Southern Annular Mode, became positive. And so it was when the winds started accelerating around the continent and um, and with related changes. And so this uh, penguin increase in the Ross Sea region uh, corresponds to this period when winds started to increase. Um, so again, here's, anyway, I'll repeat that one again. Um, okay, so the story here is that in, in uh, windy places, you're gonna find penguins. Um, and again, um, oh, Okay, oh well, yeah, okay, so um, this is the, the, you know, next to the coast, the wind is keeping the sea ice offshore so that these penguins uh, have easy access to food. Um, okay, so, but this, the wind can only do so much. The, the, the polinia, so this, these yellow things are penguin colonies. The green um, are the result of tracking penguins on their foraging trips. And so you can see that um, uh, this planinia here can keep getting bigger, but after, at some point it's not really, you know, it, 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 the, the further increase is like neutral to these penguins. Um, so anyway, uh, then I also went over this. Um, uh, these penguins also need um, this ice-free area, glacial, free of glacial ice near to areas where there's free of sea ice. Um, 
And there, because of the slight temperature increase in the Southern Ross Sea, um, there is has been a bit of a retreat of um, glaciers. In this case, it's Beaufort Island, um, Southern Ross Sea. And back in the 1950s, um, it's aerial photo. The um, penguin colony is described here in purple. But as time went on, the, the ice um, has disappeared, and so the penguin colony has expanded. Um, it was, for a long time, Beaufort Island didn't really participate in that pattern that I showed you that these other colonies were showing because it was hemmed in by ice. Thus, a lot of um, penguins, you know, chicks raised here actually come to these other colonies until um, climate change cause these glaciers to begin to retreat and now very few very few immigrants from this colony showing up at the others. So this is an important thing. You've heard about ice shelves and ice sheets retreating. It's really bad news for Miami, but it's actually good for penguins. Um, anyway, this just shows that as the amount of available habitat increased so did the numbers of penguins in this colony. Um, okay, so there's a geologic scale to this as well in the Ross Sea. Um, again, with uh, carbon-14 dating, um, these uh, penguins have, by analyzing the mummies in these colonies, been able to uh, actually um, really date the retreat of ice sheets during the, the um, Holocene period, the last 12,000 years. Um, so the ice sheet was, has been treating back this way. So the most recent colonies are these ones that I've been talking about um, that aren't all that old um, as compared to ones farther north. Um, I don't know if we really need to be, get into this, but these colonies in the, in the northern part of Victoria land are actually fairly young, but a um, little twist to all this is that um, the reason they're young is that they're mm, okay, back in the, in the glacial maximum, sea level was um, decreased by 200 meters. So the, any penguin mummies now are underwater because if all the, the persons who have been dating these mummies have only been finding recent mummies and the, the really old ones are you know, need scuba to uh, sample. Um, so anyway, it's not, it's really interesting. But, and so anyway, there is, uh, oh yeah, the other thing is that because of sediment cores, that is cores made in the ocean bottom, um, we know that there was a polynia off this part of um, Antarctica during the last glacial maximum when the ice sheets were out this far. Um, because the diatoms are different in this area. Um, and so anyway, there's all these different components that are coming together to give us this sort of really long-term perspective to climate change. All right. Okay, so what about, that's like the old past and the recent past. So uh, now what? Okay, this sort of gives you an idea of you know, what I've been talking about, the wind. The winds around the Antarctic have been accelerating. The, the polar jet stream has been bowing um, in recent. So the result is that we get these intense offshore, increasingly stronger offshore winds in the Ross Sea sector and these increasingly stronger onshore winds in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Um, and climate models. Uh, predict that this is going to keep happening for at least the next few decades, um, really until global warming actually catches up to the ozone hole. So right now the ozone hole is doing wondrous things for penguins in the Ross Sea. Um, okay, so here we have this expanding sea ice in the Ross Sea sector, and so, you know, what implication does this have for these penguins? Well, we analyzed um, 
few decades worth of penguin counts, and we found that um, in years when there's an extreme amount of sea ice extended way off the coast, um, five years later there's actually a decrease in the penguin colony size. Colony size. The reason why this, there's a lack of five years is that five years is actually the year number of years required for penguins to mature. So what appears to be happening is in years when there's a huge amount of sea ice, um, five years later you get a decrease in the colony, and this is seemingly because there's higher mortality up in this young this, this age class that um, was produced in the year of extensive sea ice. Um, and so we actually investigated this a bit by putting these GLS tags on a penguin. These tags use you know sunlight day length, day length um, and the time of local noon to determine where this penguin is. It's the same kind of information you get used to get if you're like in the clipper ship days and you had your sex and all that kind of stuff. That's what you were you're using the same data um, to determine where you were that this is being recorded. So really it's just recording day length and then comparing it to GMT and from that you can determine what latitude and longitude. All right, so we put a bunch of these on penguins and so it, we can be able to understand their winter journeys. Um, essentially what we found is that these penguins uh, traveled north across the Antarctic Circle, which is about here, um, which means they went far enough north where there's actually light. Uh, we, another study we did, penguins we know are afraid of the dark. Um, the reason they're afraid of the dark is they can't see if there's any predators around. So they won't dive into the water if they can't see that there's no predators. And so in the winter they go across the Antarctic Circle to where there is light. Um, but also, and it's really, we found that um, most of their movement is a function of the movement of the sea ice. And so they really just essentially ride a merry-go-round. Um, they sit on ice floes every, you know, for 20 to one hours every day, just going where the ice flow is going, and then they jump off it for a few hours to feed. So they're really just riding this merry-go-round um, around the, uh, what's called the Ross Gyre. Um, the Ross Gyre is here. These penguin colonies are, that we are studying are here. This is the Ross Sea continental shelf. And this is the Ross Gyre, which is um, generated by wind. And this wind is increasing. And sea ice extent is increasing. And so penguins should be decreasing, right? we found that in years of extreme ice extent, five years later, there are fewer penguins. Um, okay, so what, why? Well, there's this thing called the southern boundary of the Antarctic circumpolar current. This is the circumpolar current. Um, it has what's called the southern boundary. So, and I'll show you that projection of increasing wind, and it, it was more of this offshore area where the main part of the circumpolar current occurs. So there is this uh, southern boundary to it. Inshore of that boundary, the oceanography is a bit different, but it's also a very, very much more productive um, south of the southern boundary. And for, for instance, this shows where the way all the whales were taken. So you can see that mostly the whales were taken south of the southern boundary of the circumpolar current. So penguins in their wintering, they want to winter south of the southern boundary. But sea ice is expanding. So in these years with expensive sea ice, they're being evicted north of the southern boundary to waters that are far less rich than they would hope they would want to be in. And so this is our explanation for why, um, number one, there's a more tough higher mortality when there's more sea ice. Um, but it also sort of suggests because these extreme ice events are becoming more and more common because of the accelerating wind 
um, the daily penguin um, population of the Ross Sea should be decreasing, just like they are in the Antarctic Peninsula, but for a different reason. Um, okay, so what actually is going on here? Um, there are other things happening. Um, and it has to do back to the whales. Um, the Minky whales, they said it was the last baleen whale that was attacked by humans. Um, they, in the Ross Sea, in, actually in the, in the wintering area that we subsequently determined for this, these penguins in Ross Sea, there were about 20,000 Minky whales re removed um, during this 60s, 70s, and 80s before the whaling convention occurred um, and so this is a period when penguins were increasing so uh, and since that time um, so whaling stopped and um, also so humpback whales have been increasing um, minke whales began to increase as well but they've minke whales have also been competing with these larger whales and not competing all that well but anyway there's a lot more whales a few fewer minke whales um, and so um, some minke whales okay and so I have to ask this very like uh, and now hopefully you're not all confused but <laughs> it's definitely complex um, all right so here we have um, this figure again. So this period, when I, before I showed you, or explained this is when the winds were starting to increase. But this was also the period when the whales were, were disappearing from the penguins' wintering area. And here, out here, um, these whales are recovering. Um, so you can see that this sort of trajectory is similar to what is happening in the Antarctic Peninsula, at least with the chinstrap penguins. So as the whales became fewer, penguins became more. As the whales recovered, the penguin uh, increased, sort of tabled. Um, but at, during all this time, the winds were increasing and kalinias were developing. So we got a bunch of things going on simultaneously. Um, and But you can see here that um, for a long time, um, the uh, you know the penguin increased and then the this increase stopped as the whales began to recover. Um, so really, rather than like the chinstrap penguins, the Adelie penguins uh, becoming severely reduced because of the increasing winds and polinias, the um, climate change was actually saving these penguins from uh, disappear becoming far less abundant. Um, and this, and, but, so here it is, um, you know, up, is the trends up to the future, up to the present. But you can see that um, in the most recent years, the, the other figure stopped in 2005, you can see that the penguins have started to increase again. Um, the whales are increasing. So what's, what's going on? Um, Okay, so as I said, um, climate uh, saved these penguins from, climate change saved these penguins from becoming less abundant owing to whales taking their food. Okay, so now, but now, you know, what, what's going on? The whales are recovering, lineas are increasing, um, sea ice is, is uh, expanding, these penguins should be decreasing or not. Um, let's see, there's like, and so here we have this new period of population increase. All right, so now, unfortunately, uh, commercial fishing has discovered the Ross Sea, um, and particularly fishing for, it's called the Antarctic cod, or the, it's actually the Antarctic toothfish which in stores you'll see labeled as Chilean sea bass. Um, 
Antarctic toothfish, they are been classified as sort of the shark of the Antarctic, these huge fish, they're like as big as me. Um, all the other fish are uh, pretty small and they're all hugging the bottom. The Antarctic toothfish is only one of uh, a few um, fish in the Antarctic family of fishes that is neutrally buoyant. It actually occurs in the water column um, and therefore can actually compete with penguins for food. In fact, the Antarctic, in the water column, the Antarctic toothfish mainly eats this other neutrally buoyant so-called herring of the Antarctic, the Antarctic silverfish. And this is an important prey for penguins as well. So um, there's been this very lucrative uh, fishery that has established not too long ago. Um, $1,000 for one fish, that's you know, pretty, that's worth going 2,000 kilometers from New Zealand to uh, extract from the ocean. And so you can see that this fishery has been um, taking essentially um, hundreds of thousands of these fish from the Ross Sea. And um, these fish don't mature until they're on average 17 years of age. So this fishery has essentially wiped out the, the older, larger fish from the system. Um, and, even, and in the short time that the fishery has existed, there, there really hasn't been any replacement of these larger um, sorts of in, individuals. And you can see in this, this is the fish catch in various years. You can, this is the age or the size of spawning right here. You can see that back when the fishery started, actually over here, they were catching spawning sized fish. Uh, nowadays, they're um, down to fish that are six or seven years of age. They're also not large enough that they acquired the fat completely. Buoyant. So they're down now to, to extract the fish from the bottom uh, of the ocean. There's no longer fish in the water column that are eating food that penguins want to eat. Um, anyway, this just shows the, uh, the disappearance of these larger fish as, as time has gone on. Uh, yeah, anyway, so in McMurdo Sound, which is near where these colonies are that we've been studying um, on about the beginning of the 2000s, the millennial period. Um, these large fish have disappeared from um, this part of the world. Um, okay, so what's happening is that these large toothfish eat the same prey as penguins. Um, the result is that um, we are proposing is that now the growth in numbers of penguins is because of more food to eat um, and as a result of fewer competitors. So um, a daily penguin should be decreasing because of climate change, but they're not. And it's because of this fishery that is um, benefiting penguins. So, you know, Shouldn't, have, shouldn't complain, right? <laughs> okay, so anyway, that's a story. Um, and um, we have a website that has some of our stuff on it, and also check out The Last Ocean. Um, you can at least see a trailer for a film that has won uh, awards that can be. 20 film festivals in the past few years um, about the, the fact that the Ross Sea was the last stretch of ocean that had not been seriously affected by humans, but now, um, anyway, it's looking like humans have now extended their tentacles to just about everywhere. Okay, I think that's Anyway, so if you have any questions, I'll um, be happy to answer them. I, I, I should say, 
in the recent news, like the last few days, the almost headlines about uh, scientists um, and sea level rise um, to you know really write home about. Um, <clears throat> well, this is not old. This is a fairly old story, but it's only because climate and climate scientists have gotten some courage um, to really talk about the immediate future rather than projecting everything to like 2100 when like you know two generations from now so they're they've really just becoming more great rather than being pummeled by um, Fox News or climate doubters they're now these scientists are now like saying what they've known for a while and so the, these ice sheets are disappearing, and it's because of um, warming. Um, I don't want to get into uh, just maybe thinking about maybe some questions you might have, but it does have to do with global warming, um, and it has to do with the warming of what's called circumpolar deep water that's underneath, that flows underneath the surface water where penguins live, and it comes up at the edge of the continent and underneath these ice shelves and so it's melting these ice shelves from the bottom up and once these the heads of these ice shelves which are on the bottom disappear then there's no longer this dam that's holding back the ice field behind it so now these glaciers are beginning to um, accelerating their journey to the sea and so anyway I just wanted to mention this in case you were wondering about global warming and Antarctica and that kind of stuff. So, but anyway, if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Increase wind? Yeah. Well, it 
the um, stratosphere and the troposphere are, because of the difference in temperature, do have this pressure differential. And um, so wind you know, travels from high pressure to low pressure. But then because of Earth's rotation, it um, gets reflected to its uh, left in the southern hemisphere. And so that is what has caused the acceleration of this certain polar wind. It looked like across all three species there was a decline in like the early 2000s. And I saw something in your last slide, or one of your last slides about mega icebergs. Oh. Um, and I was just wondering what caused yeah, that. Yeah, that was um, decline. mega iceberg that is kind of like a glitch. Not a glitch. It's actually a very, it's a very educational experiment that was, it's what you call it like a natural experiment. Uh -huh. Yeah, so these, ice, these huge icebergs are like 70 kilometers long. long broke off the Ross Ice Shelf and got stuck and blocked the ice, blocked actually only in development um, for five years. And so what it was is uh, this experiment reversed, it's more like the reverse of global climate change, um, causing more of the short term a lot more sea ice. And so the penguins reacted negatively to this more ice. Um, but then the I then these big icebergs went away and things went back. And so this was kind of like an interesting experiment that we milked pretty extensively. And made the news as well.